to you. We'll see you a bit later on. Thank you. Now, many Australians have a common link to the monarchy and share some of the mixed sentiments we've just been hearing about being expressed in the United Kingdom. To discuss this, we're joined by the co-chair of the Australian Republican movement, Craig Foster. Welcome. The Liberal MP and monarchist, Julian Leeser. Good to see you. And Wiradjuri and Wellwyn woman, lawyer, Teela Reid. Welcome to all of you today. Teela. It's strength of our country too. We are also joined by Wiradjuri man and host of Q&A, Stan Grant. Welcome, Stan. Hey. Good to have you. When you hear the words stability, continuity, tradition on this day, how do you respond to that? Well, it's not our continuity. It's not our tradition. It's not our stability. You know, the Australia that Julian spoke about there, the Australia with an Indigenous heritage, a British foundation and the migrant richness of the migrant experience is a lovely idea. I don't know where that Australia is. We haven't lived in that Australia. There is no Indigenous foundation, Indigenous heritage to Australia. Australia sought to erase the Indigenous heritage. We weren't at the, at the Federation um, discussions. We weren't at the table. We weren't sharing in power. Indeed, we weren't counted when the Constitution was written. Um, we were never seen as a part of modern Australia. Indeed, one of the founding fathers, Alfred Deakin, spoke of an Australia in 100 years from now where there'll barely be a brown or black face on the continent. The phrase at the time was to smooth the dying pillow. Um, when we talk about the crown being above politics, it's not above politics for us. In the name of that crown, martial law was declared on my people, Wiradjuri people. Next year will mark 200 years since the declaration of martial law in what was known as the Bathurst Wars. Now, this isn't, this isn't settler indigenous people conflict. This is a declaration of martial law and a state of emergency under the seal of the Crown, a war reported at the time as an exterminating war, an exterminating war. So we need to understand what this represents. It's nice to talk about a fantasy Australia where we share in these multiple heritage and we all live in this country where we are equal and we come to this equally. That's an Australia I'd love to believe in too. That's an Australia that our people have fought for. That's an Australia my grandfather fought for in World War II and returned to the real Australia where he was barred from entering a pub to drink with the mates that he'd served with, blocked from getting on a train to go home in the uniform he wore when he served this country. That Australia I would love to believe in. Aboriginal people have worked for that Australia. We fought in the 1967 referendum to be counted in that Australia. But we are a long way from that Australia. And the crown is not above politics to us because the symbol of that crown w w represented the invasion, the theft of land, and in our case, the exterminating war, which next year will mark 200 years. It is alive and it is real. We heard Teela talk about the lived experience. I was back in Bathurst just last week meeting with our elders who say that they want an end to the war that's never ended. Where's our treaty? The only Commonwealth nation in the world not to have signed a treaty with First Nations people. We're still looking for recognition in the constitution. We're still fighting for that, that voice. Where is the recognition of what happened under the name of the Crown and the resolution before we even begin to talk about the fantasy Australia or the reconciled Australia? Stan, in your extensive writing and research on this issue, you've also written about the ways in which you have personally benefited from what the British have given us, given the world. I think a lot of people could probably relate to that mm. in feeling quite polarised about the issue. How does that sit for you? I'm not polarised by it. Um, those traditions, the traditions of modernity, the traditions of enlightenment, uh, belong to all of us. They are not the possession of a crown or of Britain. Those things we enter into. What I wish is that we had been able to enter into those things as we were. And we have been fighting to be who we are in the world. My father has fought to uphold our language, to maintain our language and our culture as a way of being able to speak back to the world as we are. A language, by the way, that he saw his father jailed 
for speaking when he was a little boy. I mean, this is, this is the real Australia. Before we get to the fantasy Australia, the Disneyland Australia, let's deal with the real Australia and let's not imagine that we can just look at this ceremony tonight and see this as something that is distant, that is just ceremonial, that doesn't hold weight. It holds weight for First Nations people because that crown put a weight on us. And we are still dealing with that. And if we are going to live in the Australia that we can live in, the Australia that all of us can sit around this table and share in with our differences, our backgrounds, we must come to terms with these truths and we must build a power sharing arrangement that recognises the depths of, of, of contact in this country and the heritage of this country that belongs to all, that we hold in safekeeping for all and have fought to preserve while others had sought to erase it. I enjoy the best of those things. My grandfather fought in a war, spoke his own language, kept by his bed the works of William Shakespeare and the Bible. That is us. That is who we are. But we have a right to enter that world as we are. Craig Foster, I want to bring you in at this moment because you're someone who's very, obviously, with your work with the Republican movement, you're very preoccupied with the story we tell ourselves yeah. about who we are mm. and the stories we're allowed to tell exactly. about who we are and what's been hidden in the past. Mm. How do you think of all of that? I know you're not one for pomp, right? Mm. But on a day like today, recognising there are some people who have, you know, at attachment, there are some people like, mm. like Julian for whom this holds, you know, great significance... And there are some for whom this is, you know, an, an, an avatar or a symbol of, mm. of, of, many, of brutal dispossession. Exactly. The most important thing um, today, and it's, it's historically significant because it comes in the year that we're talking about a literary statement and voice to parliament. We have the first coronation in 70 years. And what I'm seeing is that we, keep, we, we like to talk about stability, but we've also had at the core of our culture, a stability of thought. Mm. And the Crown and the, the royal family was always immune to criticism. And they were immune to questions. And we're now asking these questions and listening in Australia and learning the truth of our history. And so to, to what, what, you know, what some people in Australia try to characterise this is, is just benign pageantry and, you know, and a wonderful show and that we should enjoy. But the reality of it, First Nations, Indigenous and anti-slavery groups right across the Commonwealth are telling us as well, not just their own First Nations people, is that this has a, a malignant past, this has an element which is painful, this has an element which is about suffering for hundreds of millions of people. And we've never been able to recognise that. It's always been about denial. And of course, we know, you know, last September and the sad passing of Elizabeth II, you know, prior to that, Australia was taught, and I was taught, that these questions couldn't be asked. I was taught that the, the Crown and the monarchy was a wonderful institution and they were above uh, accountability. The wonderful thing in 2023 is everyone is accountable. Mm -hmm. And what I find really interesting at this period in our history is we're going back in time to learn truths so that we can genuinely understand each other and walk forward together and at the heart of those untruths is this monarchy. At the heart of the wound in this nation is the crown. And yet the crown have been above reproach. The crown has been above question. And I think it's incredibly important now to see that the Australian media and First Nations powerful voices, and it's moving to hear both Taylor and Stan talk about their experience and their upbringing and what it means to all of us. People often talk about, and we saw this when Queen Elizabeth passed away, where well, you have to be respectful. There's a difference between respect and deference and obeisance. Respect is about understanding the truth and the two words that Taylor used, truth and justice. And therefore, we can, I think, um, rec recognise and acknowledge the inheritances of the British tradition at the same time as, on the other hand, understanding that they are at the heart of the dispossession 
of the stolen land of our First Nations people and of massacres and attempted genocide in this country and others. That's really important. And the beauty for me is I can sit here now and say, we're having this conversation. You know, it's liberating for the country. You know, it's liberating for all of us. And Taylor, I think, perfectly characterised the contradiction at the heart of Australian culture right now is people feel deeply uncomfortable because we're trying to extend some respect to an institution that we recognise has made a significant contribution to the country at the same time that we are walking this journey and we're learning about what actually happened. Uh, and therefore, it's important to see that Australia is now actually stepping into what Taylor called discomfort, and I think that's right. It is discomforting. You know, two days ago I spoke, and it should be, two days ago I sat on a press conference uh, uh, with uh, 12 you know, Indigenous First Nations anti-slavery groups from 12 of the Commonwealth nations of the 14 non-UK that Charles is still head of state for, and they were calling for apology, formal reparations and repatriation of remains, of which there's around 32,000 and artefacts First Nations. Your property, Stan's property, Taylor's property, Australia's property uh, and it, it was deeply discomforting mm. because other countries in the Commonwealth, Teela, uh, other uh, uh, countries in the Commonwealth are talking and using different terms to us because we've never been open to using them. You know, they talk about genocide. You know, mm. they talk about crimes against humanity which they are now recognised as. Finally, and I would say joyfully, we're starting to come to terms with these moments. And this is today is, is historically significant because it may, and I hope it is, but this may well be the start of a different Australia and the, the f end of the final element of can the I, British Empire. Can, can I just add to that too? Yeah. I think when we raise these things, we have to stop seeing these things as an attack. That's right that these, this is a discussion we need to have. My God, if anyone has given love to this country, it is my people, because we have a love yeah. of this place, an enduring love that we extend to those who showed no love for us. It is not an attack. I think it's also worth pointing out that while we're having this debate, we're having this discussion here about what this moment means, in effect, this is already the rear view mirror. The world has turned. Whether we formally become a republic or when we do, when we formally recognise or sign treaties, the world has already turned. This is not the empire that Queen Elizabeth was crowned head of. This is a different world. The American century is fading and we are seeing the rise of China, which is changing our world. The economic gravity of the world is shifting. By 2050, it's expected that only one Western nation will be in the top 10 economies of the world. The institutions of global order are being reshaped because the world is not defined in the image of empire anymore. So this has already happened. We're having a conversation about something that is already in the rear view mirror. This event tonight, is anachronistic because it doesn't speak to the world that we're already in. Stan, I want to come back to you in a moment about what you see in this ceremony and what it says about what Britain thinks of itself, particularly in your experience as a foreign correspondent. Julian, I want to be, bring you in here. When you hear these grievances, the love for Australia and the truth, need to have mm, these yeah. discussions. Not, not yeah. a grievance. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a truth, truth spoken yeah. with yeah. love. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think of that? Well, I, I thoroughly respect the position that Stan brings to this discussion and that Teela brings to this discussion, and I understand the position too. Um, and I think, as I say, later this year, we're going to have an opportunity to complete the Constitution, and that will hopefully be a moment of healing for the country, because for the first time we will recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our Constitution, and that's absolutely vital. I think the other thing to say is, in 2008, the government issued the apology. And that was an apology on behalf of the whole government. That include, that's everything from the Crown all the way down. If the Crown, won, at, at some point, speaking in an Australian context, uh, wants to address some of these issues, they will, that will occur because the, the Crown, the King, will have been advised by their Australian ministers to do so. We can't focus entirely on what has happened in the past because 
pass to another country, the Crown is different then. The Crown today is a different institution. The fact that the Australian contingent tonight to the coronation has several Indigenous people as part of it. The fact that my colleague and friend, the Labor Senator Pat Dodson in 1999, went with a group of Indigenous elders to see Queen Elizabeth and said that he had never had a meeting in Australia where he was shown the level of respect uh, that he had received by, by, by the Queen at that time, I think is so important. I hope, and as I've written in The Australian today, that our next Governor-General is an Indigenous Australian, because we are at that point in our history and there are plenty of people that are qualified, and I think that is something, again, that will help bring us together. I, I, I just want to add to that, you know, I absolutely respect Julian, where Julian's coming from this, and Julian's commitment to these issues, but can we stop framing this as the past, Julian? Today, in 2023, First Nations people are the most impoverished and imprisoned people in the country. In some parts of this, this country, where my blood is, the average life expectancy for a First Nations male is 47. We die across the board 10 years younger. My God, I wish we were just talking about the past. Mm -hmm. Sam, I want to do things to, to address that. I, I, I do, indeed, too, but and, this uh, is not a discussion uh, about the past. It is about how the past frames our ongoing continual suffering of one group of people, Julian. One group of people it's also as a about direct how we result. Address that, that, it, that it, suffering it, too. it is indeed. But the entire conversation has immediately shifted to the past. This is not just about the past. I, I, I want to add to this because I'm a historian who I've spent considerable amount of time in the Royal Archives. I've um, and archives around the world looking at the at the at the royal family and what they did. And there is still an attempt to control the information that's available to historians. So when we talk about a reckoning with the past, I think um, it's actually, can we just talk about what happened? Can we see all of the documents? Can we actually reckon with a legacy? So it's not politicised. It's not an ideological thing. It's more, you know, it is as Stan's talking about, it's kind of a, 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 a truth of what happened. I was trying to get to the full truth of what Queen Victoria did and documents were hidden from me. So it's that sense of that's why when some people in England now are talking about the modernising of the monarchy, it's, it's an era of transparency and openness. Do you think that we can, that Charles can usher in that and, and actually have, have more of these kinds of conversations. So look, that's a challenge I, for him. I think Charles is a, is a thoroughly modern monarch. I mean, you look at some of the, the things that he's been doing in, in his time as Prince of Wales, um, he advocated for action on climate change long before it became fashionable. He was derided for his views about, you know, the built environment and the natural environment but now those views are, are entirely mainstream look at some of the changes he's made to the coronation service um, today look at the way in which he has positioned his role as defender of faith of the faith in the context of the Anglican tradition uh, bringing in other faiths to, to that tradition look at the fact that there is a Jewish composer that's actually composed some of the the hymns and the music this evening I think all of that indicates um, a, a monarch that is looking to, to modernise. I think all of us are looking, to your point, Julia, for a our richer history. understanding of our history. Yes. And, and, and for a richer understanding of, of where we've come from uh, that will help us inform the present and the future. Uh, and, and I think, uh, uh, to Craig's point, the idea that we... I'm, I'm almost 47. The idea that we haven't been able to criticise the Crown before. I mean, I can't think of a period in, in, in my life where that hasn't been... where the Crown hasn't been subject to some form of criticism, be it satire, or be at a Republic debate. The fact that we're not clapping Craig in irons for running the Republican movement, and I would never suggest we do that, indicates that actually we, 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 we are... Just my own name there. It's probably appropriate that you talk about that. It's probably appropriate that you talk about irons, because this is what we're talking about in the history of Australia. There were irons, there was slavery, and this is what the Crown was at the heart of. Can I just pick up a couple of those points? Firstly, this concept that the Crown is somehow neutral, and apolitical. We know from the palace letters, of course, that that is a lie, that's a nullity, and that's simply not the case. To your point about history, there was only one reason why the Queen buried those letters for 45 years from the Australian people, uh, which is a, 
a deeply anti-democratic move um, to deny us the truth of what occurred in 1975 was to protect the Crown. It was not to protect the Australian people, nor were uh, uh, the Governor-General's actions at that time. I think when we talk also about the apology in 2008, that's the Prime Minister. The Governor-General wasn't standing there apologising on to, behalf. To the stolen generations. Yeah, um, that's right. And limited to the stolen exactly generations. Right. We didn't go back to the start of the country, right? And that wasn't the Crown. Who deserved that apology too? Of course they deserved the apology. And so Australia's deeply proud of that apology, but that's just that's that's a small piece of the broader story. Mm -hmm. So to to you know to try and portray to the Australian people for any of us and um, that you know somehow that apology uh, is a move either by the monarchy or by the crown or somehow ameliorates their accountability and their responsibility is just fundamentally wrong. Stan, can I ask you too, there are a couple of Indigenous women who've been invited as part of the Australian delegation attending here today. They're thrilled to mm. be there. I, I wonder, you know, to what degree these views we've been hearing are shared among younger Indigenous people uh, who, who may not have the, well. the, yeah, more vehemently in some respects. But I, I had dinner with Princess Anne last year. Hmm. I've met the Queen on several occasions. Uh, I've met King Charles on several occasions. I was in England as a correspondent when Princess Diana passed away. We are raised, Jeremy, and in, in my language, Teela's language, our people's language, with Yindyamara. Yindyamara is a deep and profound respect. They will attend that, that service, that commemoration tonight, the coronation, with a deep and profound respect, representing our people at this event. We can hold that deep, profound respect and we can bring our love to the truth of the conversation that we need to have here. And I know Teela will come in and have some things to say about this, but I just wanted to say, even sitting here, the dissonance, the way that we enter Australia. Craig is supporter of a republic. I don't know that we can even go to a republic until we have brought peace to our, to our country, for our people. Yeah. Um, Julian, of course, is a, is a proud monarchist, and, there are, and I, I respect that position knowing for all what the Crown represented. But even when we talk about history, for us, we read history through trauma. We don't read history in a linear way. Mm. History lives in us. It is not referential. It's not footnotes. It is, it is scars. It is broken bones. Yeah. And it is too many damaged souls. Mm. And we need to heal and bring love to the healing. This conversation is so important and I'm so glad that we can have this yeah, because it's necessary and, and Teal will no doubt have a lot to say about how younger people say I do. This. I do want to bring Teela in for a moment of course that as we're having this discussion people are filing into the Abbey there and people will have noticed some familiar faces. There was John Kerry um, and we also have seen Nick Cave and Nick Cave had a really fascinating response to people who said you're a Republican why are you going shouldn't the younger Nick Cave be embarrassed about that and he wrote about I want to I beyond in debates about the abolition of the monarchy, I hold an inexplicable emotional attachment to the royals, the strangeness of them, the deeply eccentric nature of the whole affair that so perfectly reflects the weirdness of Britain itself. He's, he said, I'm drawn to the bizarre, the uncanny, the stupefying, the spectacular, the awe-inspiring. There is like a huge spectrum of like views on on what we're seeing unfold between before us right now. But Tila, can we can we bring you in? You've been listening to this conversation we've been having and, and, and a lot of this debate is about generational change. Um, Tell us, I know you've been looking into some of the documentation and the arguments around the, the Republican debate in 1999. Can you tell us what you thought of them when you were reading them? When, you know, I've, I've always been very curious, especially ever since I was um, a law student um, about the Republic issue and um, its, its spectacular fa failure in Australia. Um, in 1999 and so yeah just having kind of a brief look back as Dan says in the review mirror um, I'm actually so glad it did fail at the time um, what some Australians might remember is they weren't just asked the question on the head of state they were also asked a second question in relation to the preamble and that preamble attempted to write into the Constitution the word Aborigines um, and recognise Aborigines and 
I personally would feel devastated being recognised as um, who I am foremost a Wiradjuri woman, but written into a colonial document as the Aborigines. Um, yeah, that was that was a deep moment of reflection for me. And you know, I think moving forward as a nation, one of my messages would be to millennials. And many people care about this. You know, it's not just First Nations peoples. It's so many young people um, within my circles who deeply care about the fact that they live on unceded First Nations lands and waters um, and the future of our nation. Because so many things that have come with the Crown um, and implanted here uh, do not represent us. The flag, the anthem, um, many people don't relate to them. I remember as a young girl in Gilgandra, you know, marching to the school quad and being forced to sing an anthem that I felt so confused by um, and didn't reflect the stories I was told back home around the campfire with my elders about the legacy of the invasion and the brutality that they had endured as a result of the Crown. And so I think we do have an opportunity here with indeed these difficult discussions to make sure that we embrace this moment um, that we can look forward to becoming um, the kind of nation where we want to see at First Nations people front and centre. And when you think about other documents as well, Julia, you know, the Governor Thomas um, Brisbane, who declared uh, martial law on my people, if you go back to those documents, um, he said, I quote, the natives beyond the rule of law and so any future discussion about the rule of law, the constitution and um, the, the place of First Nations peoples has to include First Nations sovereignty in this discussion because we have never ceded that. And I don't see, think that that's um, a, a thing that other Australians should fear. It's absolutely something we should embrace as a full expression of our nation's story. Um, the many beautiful things we can learn about this continent, um, if only we were to sit back around that campfire with our elders um, to understand the significance of the land we are living in here. And I just wanted to add to a point um, that was made before. Look, no one's above politics, even the Crown himself. Um, and as a lawyer here in Australia, I certainly understand and, and appreciate the significance of the Crown. Um, but when you think about, you know, the aftermath of what was declared as the Bathurst War, lots of white people and colonists at that point in time were given land grants on my land. And as a result of the legacy of that, we are still living the consequences of being locked out of an economy um, where we see now a huge difference between the economic wealth of, if you even look at my country, the Wiradjuri people um, and the non-Indigenous Australians living on that land. You go back and farmers have inherited the wealth um, of that. So I think we have to have these serious conversations in the future. Um, first, the big picture thinking about actually understanding First Nations sovereignty never been ceded and absolutely making sure that is part of our rule of law written into the nation um, and finally letting go of the crown because that chapter is about to be closed. Now these conversations we've been having around this table are the sorts of things people have been talking about right around the country in their homes and in their workplaces. We hit the streets to ask people what they think of King Charles and what he represents to them. Take a look. It makes no difference to me one way or the other whether we've got a monarchy or not. It doesn't impact my daily existence. I don't think about him that often, to be honest. Yeah, but what do you think about him becoming king? I don't really think it matters. I'm not sure if I'm going to watch it or not. Um, probably will, because I'm into the royal family. I just don't know how I feel about Charles being king. It doesn't really affect my everyday life, but... Um... Yeah, not really. I wouldn't say it's relevant to us. I think he's a decent man. I like I think, him. Yes. I think he's quite sincere. He's had a long time waiting for this. 
used to like the royal family a lot. I think the Queen had uh, something to offer us. You sort of felt secure with her there. For me, it's nice. It's good. Why are you not supposed to come king? He wanted all this thing, all this year, for come king. This never supposed to be him. Well, if he's a good man with a pure heart, like his, like his mother, I believe he, he should stick alliance with Australia. I don't really think it's much relevant to Australia. I think we're a bit too far away for it to be relevant. I don't see the British royal family having any interest in what's going on in Australia at the moment. I don't care about him. I don't care like at all. Um, when I feel like he shouldn't have taken the crown. Like I feel like maybe he should have given it up to like someone who was like younger. It's just the latching on from the past and I think uh, it's, it's time we, we become our own and get rid of, get rid of the monarchy. I quite like his environmental credentials, um, but I'm not a big fan of the royal family being in charge of Australia. So obviously a range of feelings. <laughs> yes, there. That's we right. didn't we didn't kind of select those. We just sort of took random randoms selection. off the street and said, "What do you think, Julian?" Yeah. There's a lot of people who have a range of emotions, and there's a lot of kind of in the middle going, "Yeah, you know, don't really care." Mm -hmm. How do you? Well, it, it, does I that think, reflect your world? I, I think it entirely reflects. I think it entirely indicates that structurally there's nothing wrong with having the crown and the constitution because if it was a problem, people would be marching in the street about it. They would have strong opinions about it, and the fact that there is a sort of a benignness towards uh, towards it, a sort of indifference, actually says that there's something about the system that worked. Today, I had uh, a community picnic in my electorate, and we had more than a thousand people attend. We had all sorts of organisations from scouts and guides and the RSL and the RFS and the SES, and lots and lots of families there just out to celebrate uh, a moment that's bringing people together because fundamentally the Crown is about service. It's a, it's a good system. It's not a, a bad thing in our constitution. If it was bad, if it failed, if the Crown was, was doing a bad job, you would have a completely different view of, of this and there'd be much more passion about this issue than there is. Speaking of passion, we just saw Adam Hills, by the way, entering there. We've also seen Jane, Dame Judi Dench, Maggie Smith, Dame Maggie Smith. I think Ant and Deck just walked in as well. <laughs> Lionel <laughs> Ritchie right. here. Lionel Ritchie's there, exactly. Uh, just walked in uh, a moment ago. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, Julian, about the, the range of Australians who've been invited. Sam Kerr, Leanne Benjamin, who's the former principal ballerina of the Royal Ballet, Jasmine Coe, a Wiradjuri British artist, uh, who's the only ab at, uh, the curator at the only Aboriginal-owned gallery in the UK, Dr Daniel Noor. Uh, former Young Australian of the Year, Emily Regan, a London-based nurse. This is from a huge spectrum of society in Britain. What do you think the monarchy is trying to say about who they've chosen to have at this ceremony? Well, I think the Prime Minister chose the Australian guests that would go there, and I think he rightly is, is trying to reflect, um, you know, modern Australia. You've got you know, significant presence of Indigenous Australians, which I think is a great strength of, of the guest list. You've got Australians that have achieved international success in different places. You've got a great servant of uh, of Australians who are doing it tough, like like, Dan, like Daniel Noor. I think uh, I think it's a good reflection of people. It's not a whole group of of dignitaries and people who are there because of a position. I think what they've tried to do is find people that reflect the, the, the country that we are and that we've become. And I think that's a great thing. I think they will well represent Australia tonight. Can I just ask you, just following up on people's opinions to it, we've been looking at the polls. Um, the polls are not massively consistent on a number of fronts, but they are, they do seem to be saying a lot of people are disengaged in the UK as well as here, like 64% according to a YouGov poll. How much do you care about this coronation of King Charles? Not very much or not at all? Two thirds. So, um, should we have, we've got, we've got, we can see it there on the screen. Um, we also, in Australia, should Australia end its formal ties to the monarchy? 54% saying yes. Should the PM hold a referendum on the future of the monarchy? Yes, 57%. What we do know is that for decades, people have been saying once the Queen passes away, we will be having these discussions. How do you, do you think that's what's going on? Well, I think, firstly, we've got a very important referendum this year on Indigenous recognition of the voice to Parliament. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw the Prime Minister's comments in the last couple of days that he doesn't want to preside over, a, 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 you know, decades of referenda. We had a 10-year debate last time on the Republic referendum. Um, and, you know, 
since that time, the Republican movement have, have not got together and determined what model they want to replace what is here. And there was significant division among Republicans, you know, back in 1999 about the model. Yep. It's all very well to say you want to get rid of the monarchy. What form of republic do you want to put in its place? Which is, I'm hearing, a lot of people do say this. Of course, Craig, I'm going to bring you in here because, because alongside all of this polling, we have Roy Morgan, who's been asking the same questions of Australians for decades. And the number of people supporting remaining a monarchy has gone up, they found, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. How do you I I explain mm -hmm. that? Well, actually, respectfully, that's not true, because just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, a new research and a new poll that says 60% of Australians now support a republic, 70% of Australians think don't want the monarchy and think that uh, Charles is unrepresentative of Australia. So since uh, I think when Elizabeth passed away, there was a moment when Australia had an outpouring of grief. And you think it's shifted even in the last... It has shifted remarkably. Yep. Um, and, you know, and as it should, and I think in line with all these conversations. But, um, you know, I'm... I'm hugely respectful of uh, Julian's position on The Voice, as he's very well aware and publicly respectful of that and, and uh, you know, I think it's wonderful what he did. Um, but I've just got to pick up on this notion that the fact that Australians don't care about Charles means that it's the right arrangement for us. I mean, there can be... F there cannot be a more anemic view of the capabilities or the right of Australians to inherit our own country than those statements. The fact that when Elizabeth in 52 was crowned, or the last king in 36, George the, 30, uh, George the sixth, that the Air Force was in the air, there was 200,000 people in Centennial Park in Sydney. When, you know, the last time this happened, Australia's very much felt a part of the British Empire. Now, we are completely disconnected from this for very good reason. But we also have a right to envision a better future where Australians actually own our own country. And we see this conversation a lot. It's, look, um, you know, this is okay and this has worked all right and so why, it, what is that, you know, it's degrading, it's demeaning to Australian capability, it's demeaning to our conception and our identity of ourself and of course I'm just talking here about Australia as a, as a broad group, I'm not, you know, we're not even, and we've already discussed, you know, the issue at the heart of the nation and how we have to heal those wounds first before we do so. It's also not true about that, that um, you know, Republic Movement doesn't have a model. In fact, it does have a model. Um, you, anyone can go to the website republic.org.au and see the model there. It's very clear. Um, however, we think that this next conversation is incredibly important to run through that process and hear the concerns of Australians. And exactly, that's why I love this conversation here with you today. This is what we need to talk about. We need to bring everyone to the table and talk about what is Australia today? We are not this. We cannot any longer argue that this is us. It doesn't represent us culturally. Um, it, it doesn't work for us internationally. Um, so many of our beautiful multicultural communities have also suffered, you know, under this exact, you know, a colonisation process and the like, and feel deeply uncomfortable as well. And here we are in 2023, still wrestling with these things. It it's time we went to the nub of the matter and started to talk about where are we going as a country now? And, and I think Anthony Albanese talk, said, he, you know, said it perfectly this week. He said, this is a matter for the UK now. It's no longer a matter for us. You know, just because I'm the co-chair of the Republic movement with the brilliant Nova Paris, it doesn't mean I'm not anti-monarchy. What I'm saying is this is a matter for UK people. And I respect the views of Australians who love it or think that it's great, you know, that, that it's a great spectacle or it's a great Netflix well, a series. Too, yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. what, whatever. The, you know, we, I, I respect that. Um, however, we have to talk about ourselves and what is in our best interests and the best we can possibly be. And this can't, a head of state who is a foreign king, uh, who is not an Australian citizen, represents 15 countries aside from us, is a part-time head of state. It's no longer enough to just say, oh, well, it's worked reasonably well. Reasonably well is not good enough for Australia now. Can I just say, you know, just add this quickly, yeah. part of the, we've been talking about the cornerstones of the British tradition and the inheritance of liberal democracy. What is the fundamental building block of liberal democracy? Consent. The consent to be governed. We are still working through First Nations consent to be governed. No treaties, no recognition, no formal power sharing, no recognition of that status. We also need to work through the consent to be governed by the various people who have made this their home in the last 200 years right. and have enjoyed what we have built 
but now may want to consent to something different. If it was rejected at a referendum, that would be the answer to that consent. But consent is the fundamental building block of liberal democracy, and we are still working through that in 2023. An inheritance that does not necessarily speak historically to us, to our exclusion, or to the changing fabric of who we are in Australia today. Um, Tila, can I bring you in here because um, this idea of inheritance and ownership is one that has different profiles when you talk about the different generations that are represented in the opinion polls. When you look at who supports the monarchy and who supports the idea of becoming a republic, there's a really big generational gap that appears, isn't there? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Craig outlined the statistics quite well himself, but there's just this sentiment, I think, um, among millennials my age, that it's just absolutely time um, to, to reimagine our nation and not only imagine it but I think enact it um, and take the steps forward uh, in terms of I think especially whether you are a First Nations person or you've just you know recently called Australia home. I think that the nation looks incredibly different now and clearly um, at its point of contact or first you know invasion and so I do think that there is an opportunity in these conversations at least to ventilate um, you know not just our frustrations but honour uh, the institutions that have made us who we are but let's not lose sight of the fact that of those that are still suffering. You know, as a result of the Crown establishing institutions here, Australia itself was founded, or at least New South Wales and the colonies, founded as penal colonies. Um, you know, punishment or in prisons. And for us as Indigenous peoples, as the Uluru Statement from the Heart says, we are the most incarcerated peoples on the planet. We are not an innately criminal peoples. And I think we really have to start to grapple with um, the reality of what we're living with now. It's not just stability for, you know, those who have just found this land. For us, if you think about First Nations peoples, we have honoured and lived with and cared for this land since time immemorial. And so it's about time we absolutely start to imagine First Nations peoples at the front and centre of our nation, um, you know, abolishing prisons for one, because mm. those are also outdated in this colony, and starting to ensure that our most vulnerable people are having access to the economy and the same opportunities mm. that we all are, because this was a democracy. Um, you know, if you think about democracy, it's about the also power and you have to think about people who are in positions of power. They're certainly not black or people of colour in this country. Tila, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for sharing in this discussion. A really worthwhile thing. And it's a sort of thing that I think some people would suggest is not appropriate to be having on the day of a coronation. But it is exactly about our nationhood and who we are. And as Stan, you say, it's about love for our country.